So today, uh, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Jean Fan from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Jean is an assistant professor in biomedical engineering department, and she has many other, other affiliations. Some of them are Department of Computer Science, Center for Imaging Science, and the Kavli uh, Neuroscience Discovery Institute. Um, Jean is a computational biologist. She studied uh, biomedical engineering and applied maths at Johns Hopkins. And then she received her PhD in bioinformatics and integrative genomics uh, from Harvard, working with Peter Karachenko. And she spent few, some more time there as postdoc before starting her own lab in, um, back in Johns Hopkins in 2020. Uh, her lab's focus is on developing uh, statistical methods and computational tools for spatial transcriptomics data. And she's going to tell us more about this in her talk today. Um, but I must mention one more thing before handing over to Jean. Um, I saw one of her TED talk titled, Do Art Like Science and Do Science Like, like an Art? So she's, I think she's doing excellent in both. She has created website, a website with illustrated storybooks where children can see themselves in different STEM roles. Uh, so it's in different STEM careers. So this website is called customized.org. Do explore it. I'm sure many kids are um, getting inspired by her work. As for the second part, doing science like an art is definitely there to see uh, in her excellent methods work, which I've come across recently. Um, so a virtual welcome to Manchester, Jean. And thank you very much for making time for our seminar and over to you. Uh, just to add, so I will be monitoring the chat. Please put your questions there. And if I need to, I can interrupt Jean. Hope that's okay. Otherwise, we will be discussing them uh, at the end of the talk. Over to you, Jean. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much, Melissa. And thanks to you and Carl and Igor for inviting. And uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. And you know, I hope you're all staying healthy and doing, uh, doing well. So. Uh, just a quick uh, a shout out to, and thanks to my lab before I get things started. Uh, I think all of the work that I'm about to show you uh, is really a testament to their creativity and uh, intellect and growth, um, but also uh, re resilience, uh, particularly in these uh, continuing challenging times. Uh, this is the, the one picture that we managed to take together in the very brief uh, moment where you know everyone was vaccinated and the uh, the, the weather was still nice, so we were able to go outside. Um, but almost the entirety of my lab has been uh, remote. Uh, and I think my, my lab has managed to, to really demonstrate a lot of um, uh, resilience uh, during these times. And I hope that you know, you'll, you'll enjoy the, the, the work I'm about to share with you. So in my lab, broadly speaking, when we look at an organ, uh, such as the mammalian brain, we're very interested in understanding uh, certain basic questions like, you know, what are the different cell types in the brain? How are these cell types spatially organized? And ultimately, how is the spatial organization potentially related to the function of the tissue? Uh, we're also quite interested in how the spatial organization potentially plays a role in the maintenance of health and the progression of diseases, uh, particularly in diseases such as cancers uh, that affect the brain, such as gliomas and glioblastomas. So luckily for us, there are now you know, many different spatially resolved transcriptomics technologies that allow us to measure uh, not only you know, what genes are being expressed in individual cells or small groups of cells in a very high throughput manner, so we can you know, more um, uh, quantitatively evaluate you know, what are the transcriptional states uh, and types of cells that are present in a tissue. Uh, but now we can also preserve their spatial organization within the tissue. Uh, so then we can begin asking, you know, uh, addressing these types of questions. However, what I hope you know, you'll take away by the end of this talk is that you know, even though these technologies are available, uh, it's still very important for us to develop new mathematical approaches and computational methods uh, in order to really take advantage of this new spatial dimension of information in order to derive relevant biological insights. So my student Lila Ada and I have uh, written uh, a nature communications commentary on this, on some of the uh, opportunities and challenges we see in uh, this uh, spatially resolved transcriptomic computational analysis field. 
So you're welcome to check out our paper or uh, commentary uh, if, if that's of interest to you. Uh, and uh, I think broadly speaking, what we see is that these spatially resolved transcriptomics technologies tend to fall into uh, two broad camps. Uh, one that is more uh, molecular resolution, but targeted in the genes that you know, are being measured. And alternatively, those that are untargeted, uh, but uh, coarser in resolution. So what we call a pixel resolution. And of course, you know, depending on the type of data that we're working with, the, the, the downstream computational analyses are going to be a little bit different. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, uh, I will walk you through some of the computational methods that my lab has been developing for analyzing first the, the molecular resolution data, and I'll also explain what they, they are, um, and then following up with uh, the, the more pixel resolution data, and finally concluding with some of the computational methods that were uh, developing to really move beyond these static snapshots uh, and start inferring temporal dynamics. And we'll hopefully uh, by the end of this talk, uh, you'll understand what all these terms mean. Great, so first in terms of the methods for analyzing spatially resolved molecular resolution data, what these uh, spatially resolved data sets really allow us to do is uh, effectively take pictures of all of genes inside cells. So each point here is a different RNA and the genes, uh, the RNAs that correspond to gene A have been highlighted in turquoise here. So you can really appreciate the spatial organization of these RNAs inside the cells. Um, but then we can also do this not only for one or two genes now, but for hundreds to thousands of genes, uh, pre-selected genes. And of course, you know, we can do this not only for one cell at a time, but for thousands to millions of cells in fixed cultures and tissues. And what this allows us to do is then segment each cell uh, and then actually count how many copies of each gene are in each cell. And that effectively gives us a single cell resolution spatially resolved transcriptomics for the targeted set of you know, thousand or so genes that we're measuring here. So then what we end up with is not only an image of you know, cells in a tissue, here we have a cortical section of the mouse cortex, each point is a cell, uh, but we also are able to uh, quantify uh, how targeted such as genes are expressed in this tissue. So you know, this is a particular gene that is uh, red is high expression, blue is low expression, and you can just begin appreciating how the, the different genes are expressed in a spatially organized manner, in part due to the underlying spatial organization of the cell types. Uh, and we can do this, of course, for hundreds to thousands of different genes. And what this means is that we can further perform you know, dimensionality reduction and other types of non-spatially resolved analyses that we've uh, become familiar with in single cell transcriptomics, such as clustering analysis, so we can you know, cluster these cells based on their transcriptomic profiles and embed that into a UMAP embedding and do you know, clustering, graph-based clustering. Uh, but of course now, because we have the original spatial coordinates of, the, of these cells, we can you know, map the cell type annotations back onto the original tissue coordinates and begin just appreciating how these cell types are spatially organized in the original tissue. Uh, but in addition, you know, one question that we sought out to, to tackle is, you know, are there additional ways we can characterize spatial gene expression heterogeneity within and across cell types and tissues? Uh, and we were particularly interested in developing a method that was uh, um, uh, robust to non-uniform cell densities within tissues. Uh, so we actually, we developed a, an, an approach called meringue uh, which uh, recently came out in genome research. So please do check that out if you're interested in learning more. And what Meringue does is actually draw inspiration from geospatial analysis. Uh, in particular, there's a statistic called Moran's eye uh, that has been used to evaluate whether particular quantities, say uh, income, exhibit significant non-random spatial variation or spatial autocorrelation. Uh, so, uh, if you uh, focus in on this uh, uh, equate Moran's eyes equation, um, I'll just point out that uh, this uh, W matrix uh, is uh, uh, an adjacency weight matrix that tries to capture whether two uh, cells or neighborhoods are adjacent, spatially adjacent to each other. So it'll be 
one if you know, cells I and J are next to each other in space. Uh, and then when we look at this quantity here, uh, you might be again appreciating how if, uh, uh, if the expression level of a particular gene you know, is, uh, is high in cell I and high in cell J, then this quantity will be positive uh, and you know, the I statistic will increase. Uh, likewise, if, it's, if they're both negative, then again, this will be a positive and the I statistic will increase. Whereas if these two values are in opposite directions, then the I statistic will decrease. Uh, and essentially what it allows us to measure is it, it quantifies you know, how well correlated are uh, 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 the, the expression levels of a particular gene in, among spatially uh, adjacent neighbors. And you know, we can do this uh, historically, you know, geospatial analysis and more anxiety has been applied to things, as I mentioned, like income. Uh, so perhaps you know, if we look at the income map for, you know, I, I hope you all recognize this map, um, but uh, you can see the uh, even just visually, uh, income you know, exhibits a very high spatial autocorrelation. So um, uh, regions that are near each other uh, in you know, physical space also tend to have similar um, median weekly earnings. Uh, so there are you know, many historical reasons uh, that this is the case that we won't get into because uh, we're interested in the, bio the biology. Uh, but on the biological level, you know, there are certain genes that are, let's say, you know, always uh, 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 highly expressed uh, among adjacent neighbors. Uh, and these genes would exhibit high spatial autocorrelation Whereas there may be other genes that are um, spatially, uh, uh, that are uh, highly variable, but the variability is not necessarily associated in space. Uh, so we can use Moran's eye uh, in this manner to distinguish between genes that are variable uh, in a spatially coordinated manner versus genes that are variable, but perhaps not in a spatially coordinated manner. Oops. Great, then again, because of the flexibility of the way that spatial neighbors can be defined when we compute the Moran's eye, we can actually easily um, adapt this approach to uh, 2D, 3D, and even multi-section uh, data where we might want to uh, adjust neighbors depending on um, uh, specifically uh, to, to look for spatial autocorrelation across tissue sections uh, as opposed to within sections, for example. Um, so essentially, uh, in our paper, we were able to, to further apply meringue and Moran's eye to look for this uh, spatial uh, autocorrelation and identify spatially variable genes uh, within 3D Drosophila, within multi-section breast cancer tissues, um, but then also within cell types. Uh, so we can focus, for example, here, uh, each point is a cell in the uh, hypothalamic preoptic region, and we can look only within inhibitory I6 cells highlighted here uh, in colors. And you can appreciate how, you know, if we look at a gene like GAD1, uh, all the cells uh, that are I6 cells express GAD1, uh, but then there are other cells like MCAB1, which do exhibit uh, spatial autocorrelation and are um, uh, not expressed in all cells and are actually very variable and only uh, highly expressed in the, uh, the cells more towards the top and not the cells towards the bottom. And there are other genes that exhibit different types of spatial, spatial patterns. Um, so we can use uh, meringue to, to identify these genes in a very systematic manner and uh, apply to lots of different animals and look for uh, consistencies and so forth. Um, so if we were actually to return to uh, our mouse cortex example, and we can focus on, for example, uh, cells within the pyramidal layer here. Uh, if we were to apply meringue, we can indeed identify uh, lots of different genes that express gene expression heterogeneity that are coordinated in a spatial manner. Uh, that, uh, as you can see, you know, red is high expression again, blue is low expression again. And uh, these different patterns actually do correspond to different hippocampal subfields uh, which receive different inputs from uh, different regions of the brain. So beyond uh, computing Moran's eye, one thing that we thought was fun is that uh, we can actually build on this equation uh, specifically to take advantage of the flexibility of the uh, adjacency weight matrix that I mentioned previously. Um, but sometimes we're also not interested in looking at autocorrelation with one gene, we're interested in cross-correlations between pairs of genes. Uh, particularly, we're very interested in 
pairs of genes that may be indicative of cell-cell communication, uh, such as uh, corresponding receptors and ligands. Uh, so in Meringue, we, uh, we defined a new inter-cell type spatial cross-correlation statistic that um, uh, just intuitively you can think of uh, rather than defining all uh, spatial adjacency neighborship relationships, uh, we focus only on uh, adjacency relationships in space that are between cell type A and B. So we'll only consider neighbors if they're um, between cell types A and B as opposed to within cell types B and within cell types A, for example. Uh, and then we can specifically test for genes that may perhaps you know, be receptors that are highly expressed in cell type A and ligands that are expressed in cell type B and look for whether um, you know, cells in cell type A, when it expresses a receptor, it's always high uh, next to you know, cells of cell type B that express highly the ligand and exhibit this type of spatial cross correlation. Uh, and we can do you know, permutation testing to evaluate the statistical significance of this. So uh, using this approach, uh, we applied it to identify potential cell-cell uh, communication between uh, cells in the mouse cerebellum. Uh, we focused on Purkinje cells, which are highlighted in orange here. And then uh, the green cells are the, the cells that are uh, in the uh, neighbors. Uh, and then we can essentially test for all possible receptor ligand pairs uh, that are expressed, uh, you know, either in e either cell types. Uh, and you know, we tested essentially, you know, using the statistical approach, we can test uh, hundreds of different uh, receptor ligand pairs, um, both you know, in one cell type or another. Um, and what we end up with, uh, what we found is actually only one significant hit. Uh, where uh, we found uh, that this uh, uh, expression of this particular protein tyrosine kinase receptor uh, was highly expressed in the Purkinje cells, and it uh, was spatially uh, cross-correlated with uh, neighboring cells that express uh, this uh, secreted growth factor pleiotropin. Uh, and actually, you know, this, this turns out to be a, a known interaction between Purkinje cells and, um, and uh, Bergman's glia fibers, uh, in the uh, developing cerebellum. Uh, so um, we believe that this has uh, allowed, uh, our statistical approach is essentially allowing us to uh, recapitulate some uh, known biology, which is very cool. But of course we can, uh, you know, having demonstrated that our approach is able to recapitulate known biology, we, we're always interested in applying them to discover new things. Uh, so we collaborated with uh, Toshihara and Mario Suva's lab uh, to apply some of these uh, statistical approaches and uh, spatially resolved transcriptomics methods to characterize the spatial organization of transcriptionally distant cancer subpopulations in glioblastoma. So Mario's group previously identified uh, uh, using single cell RNA sequencing to characterize four different subtypes of glioblastoma cells uh, characterized by you know, different uh, overexpressions of uh, uh, different types of uh, markers. Um, and, but one question that we had is just, you know, how are these subpopulations spatially organized within the glioblastoma tumor itself? Uh, so we applied uh, one particular spatially resolved transcriptomic technology called MRFISH to characterize different slices of uh, GBM uh, biopsy samples. Uh, and, uh, and what we were able to do is, of course, then, you know, again, do clustering analysis to identify the different GBM subtypes. Uh, but then also other, uh, other cell types within the tumor microenvironment. Uh, but of course, now being that we have a spatially resolved transcriptomic profiling method, we can actually look to see how these uh, different subpopulations we identified are organized within uh, the, the, the cancer, uh, within the tumor. And uh, we can essentially begin asking questions like, uh, oh, if we, live, if we look within the spatial neighbors of uh, the mesenchymal subtype of GBM cells, uh, do we find more you know, uh, T cells than we expect by chance or more of this one cell type or another and iterate through all possible pairs? And what we end up finding is that uh, actually when we look within the neighbors of the mesenchymal GBM cells, we find a, 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 um, an enrichment of macrophages. Uh, among their spatial neighbors. 
Uh, and, and in contrast, we find a depletion, um, or, or we, we don't find that same enrichment in, uh, for example, oligodendrocytes or other, um, other cell types in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so there seems to be a, a particular enrichment of macrophages. And uh, that's where you know, uh, Toshi and others in Mario's group were able to do a lot of amazing additional functional validation uh, to show that indeed uh, the, the macrophages are, uh, the, the spatial organization you know, isn't uh, random, it's not just macrophages are there by chance, uh, but they actually are interacting with GBM cells through this particular OSM, OSMR signaling pathway, and uh, in that manner, um, um, driving GBM cells into a more mesenchymal-like subtype. Uh, so I think this is a, a really fun uh, example of how you know, we can integrate um, uh, different statistical approaches to begin essentially uh, characterize, uh, identifying and characterizing different aspects of uh, spatial uh, heterogeneity that you know, we can uh, potentially begin uh, measuring using these different types of spatially resolved transcriptomics technologies. Great, so then moving on a little bit, um, uh, the next part of my talk, I'd like to touch on the, the pixel resolution data sets. Um, and these data are a little bit different in that uh, rather than um, getting molecular resolution uh, um, uh, transcriptomic profiling, uh, you can think of it as uh, uh, taking you know, a very coarse, uh, maybe like a very small picture uh, where we're no longer really able to see the individual uh, molecules, but instead we see uh, spots uh, and we're able to capture all the different transcripts in these spots. Um, however, these spots essentially represent the gene expression measurements from many cells. Uh, there are many cells covered by each spot. So we're essentially no longer having a true single cell resolution per se, uh, and uh, the transcriptome the spatial transcriptomic measurements that we get are instead um, what we call these multicellular pixel resolution measurements uh, that in theory you know, may comprise uh, cells from many different cell types, uh, which could then uh, in theory you know, hinder our ability to um, identify spatial organization on a you know, cell type specific level. So uh, therefore, you know, given this type of data, and uh, we're still very interested in cell type specific spatial organizational patterns. Uh, so we didn't you know, necessarily want to just uh, do um, uh, analyze you know, multicellular uh, pixels. Uh, we wanted to see if we could recover the cell type specific spatial organizational patterns from these multicellular uh, pixel resolution data. Um, so this is a work led by Brenda Miller and my group. Uh, and uh, so we developed this approach called uh, STP Convolve, uh, and you can check out our uh, preprint on BioArchive if you're interested in learning more. But generally speaking, what STP Convolve does is uh, build on uh, a, a mathematical model called latent Dirichlet allocation, which is commonly used in topic modeling uh, to estimate uh, cell type specific gene expression profiles and cell type proportions in pixels. Uh, so when LDA is used in you know, the natural language processing and topic modeling context, uh, what it does is essentially, you know, you can think of, uh, let's say, if I, uh, different documents, like let's say different uh, entries or different New York Times articles uh, are, you know, you can think of them as collections of words. And these, um, these words comprise different topics. And then we can think of documents as being mixtures of these topics. So what uh, LBA is trying to do in the natural languaging context is, uh, is figure out you know, what, what, are the, uh, what are the latent topics in these documents and what are the words associated with those uh, topics and how are those topics distributed across documents. Uh, and I hope that you can see the parallel in the gene expression space where rather than documents, we have now pixels of these gene counts these pix pixels are made up of mixtures of latent cell types that we don't know what they are, um, but we know that you know, these uh, genes should be informative of these cell types. So we can essentially use LDA to estimate the distribution of, and association of genes with cell types and the distribution of these uh, cell types within each, each pixel. 
So what we get is uh, using uh, LDA and SDD involved, um, we essentially are able to take these multicellular pixel resolution uh, gene expression data uh, and, and uh, uh, get out uh, a deconvolved estimation of not only the uh, cell type proportions per pixel, but also the deconvolved gene expression associated with each cell type. So as a proof of concept, we first wanted to just uh, demonstrate that this approach um, was uh, uh, sensible and was uh, able to work. Um, and we, so we therefore took uh, a single cell resolution, spatially resolved transcriptomic data set uh, that you see here and, uh, and simulated a pixel resolution data set by essentially aggregating all the cells and their transcriptional profiles within contiguous pixels. Uh, represented here as a pie chart. Uh, so we aggregated all the cells in you know, each of these pies and, uh, and you know, we can show the cell type proportions um, uh, and in this manner, you know, create, create a ground truth that we can uh, benchmark our approach against. Uh, and indeed, when we apply SDD involved, we can uh, recapitulate much of the original spatial organization and we can you know, quant further quantify this and you know, note the high correlation between the deconvolved gene expression and the original ground truth gene expression, uh, as well as the correlation between the deconvolved cell type proportions and the ground truth cell type proportions in the simulated pixels. So uh, you know, we can show that our approach is able to do pretty well, um, but then we can also further apply it to lots of different uh, technologies, um, uh, for um, these different types of spatially resolved transcriptomic pixel resolution data sets with you know, pixels at different resolutions and show that we can identify um, different structures that we know to be biologically relevant and uh, consistent with known biology. Uh, the one, uh, perhaps you know, zooming into one specific example, um, um, I just want to emphasize that uh, clustering analysis is uh, on these multicellular pixels is quite distinct from deconvolution. And in particular, uh, clustering analysis may obscure a finer uh, uh, subpixel resolution cell type specific features, uh, which we can uh, better appreciate through this particular example here where uh, this is uh, the mouse olfactory bulb. Uh, and again, each point here is one of these multicellular pixels uh, uh, that represent many cells. Uh, so, you know, we can do clustering analysis and represent the clusters on this TISNI map here. So you can see approximately five clusters. Uh, so you might be led to believe that, you know, there are cell, five cell types, uh, you know, in this, uh, in the olfactory bulb. However, uh, based on our prior biological knowledge, we actually know there to be many additional distinct spatial structures uh, within the olfactory bulb. Uh, in particular, there's, uh, if you look at the center of you know, each of these uh, uh, structures, uh, we know there should be uh, something that's, uh, the, that is uh, this frustral migratory stream that actually ca carries um, uh, 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 neuroprogenitor cells uh, from the subventricular zone. Uh, so this is a structure that we expect to be there, but we don't see it when we do our clustering analysis. Uh, however, if we apply SDD convolve and uh, perform deconvolution, what we're able to do is identify a deconvolved cell type that is uh, a, a, a subset of uh, some of the uh, pixels that are towards the middle of this uh, granule cell layer. Uh, and further, uh, we can look at what genes are associated with this uh, deconvolved subtype or deconvolved uh, topic and cell type uh, and find that it indeed you know, upregulates certain genes that we know to be uh, highly expressed in, um, in uh, progenitor cells, progenitor neurons, uh, such as um, uh, SOX11, NREP, uh, that we expect to be you know, expressed in the neurons in the rostral migratory stream. And further, if we were to uh, reference uh, in situ hybridization data uh, that are much higher resolution, you know, we can appreciate how uh, these genes are indeed expressed in the middle of this granule cell layer, which is exactly where we would expect the, uh, the, 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 the migratory neurons to be present. Um, uh, that are you know, apparent from our SD deconvolved deconvolution, but, um, but not, not the most readily apparent from clustering analysis alone. Uh, so in this manner, I hope you know, I can, uh, I've demonstrated to you that 
um, you know, we can apply up deconvolution approaches uh, like STD involved uh, to recover cell type specific spatial organizational patterns and gene expression variation and multicellular pixel resolution, spatially resolved transcriptomic data uh, in a way that uh, we can't necessarily do through just clustering analysis alone. Okay, and so then yeah, for the final part of my talk, uh, I wanted us to uh, appreciate one uh, limitation uh, of the current um, spatially resolved transcriptomics approaches that I've been showing you, and perhaps you know you've already noticed, is that uh, these cells are fixed, uh, which means you know they're dead. There's uh, no way for us to uh, perturb them, you know, measure their gene expression, and you know see what they're going to do uh, at a future time point. Um, so essentially, the expression measurements that we're all measuring. Uh, represents uh, a static snapshot in time. Uh, however, just because they represent a static snapshot in time, it doesn't mean that you know, all dynamic information is lost. And you know, perhaps we can appreciate that uh, using you know, this simple example here, where you know, even though we have this static snapshot of friends jumping off the cliff, uh, you know, I think we're all smart enough to uh, infer based on this one single static snapshot that you know, there must be some pseudo-temporal ordering to when these friends jumped off the cliff. Um, so one of these people must have jumped off before the other. Uh, and you know, if you were an alien and you didn't know anything about you know, gravity, you know, perhaps I would have to tell you that on Earth you know, gravity goes down. And you know, given this uh, this information that gravity goes down, uh, now that uh, now you can tell me uh, not only what is the pseudotemporal ordering, but provide a direction to that pseudotemporal ordering. Uh, so essentially, it's the continuum of states, uh, in this case, positional states along a dynamic process, such as falling off a cliff, uh, that can be used to uh, infer how these positions change over time. Uh, so actually, you know, if I were to ask you, uh, for this friend over here, what do you predict his position is going to be at a future time point? I've told you that gravity goes down. So, you know, based on that information alone, maybe you would think that he would end up right here. Um, but of course, looking at the trajectory of all the other friends, uh, that essentially is allowing you to infer certain information about his you know, angular momentum or maybe other uh, factors uh, so that uh, actually you would probably predict that at a future time point he is going to look like this guy over here. Um, so this is kind of the same intuition that we're going to apply to um, rather than looking at you know funds falling off a cliff, we're going to look at the continuum of cell states or transcriptional states for cells along dynamic processes like um, differentiation. Uh, and essentially use that uh, continuum of transcriptional states to infer how cells, uh, cell states and cell transcriptional states may change over time. Uh, and use that to you know, predict, uh, in this case, you know, we can, we're predicting future positional states, but we can also, for the cell, predict its future transcriptional state. So that's the uh, general intuition behind RNA velocity analysis. Uh, that we can, uh, and in particular for, um, for the, the spatially resolved transcriptomic molecular profiling approaches, uh, we developed an approach called uh, RNA velocity and C2 analysis uh, that leverages certain uh, subcellular organizational features in the static image uh, to try to predict the future transcriptional state of cells. Uh, so uh, the way our model works is um, uh, that we essentially, you know, we know uh, RNAs are born in the nucleus, and eventually they get exported into the cytoplasm where they're you know, made into proteins and uh, do other things and eventually degraded. Uh, so you know, all this information is uh, visible in our spatially resolved transcriptomic molecular data. Uh, we can actually quantify or we can see and quantify you know, what is the level of nuclear RNA, uh, what's the level of cytoplasmic RNA. So then we can essentially model uh, the rate of change of the cytoplasmic RNA levels as a function of what comes in uh, minus what goes out. Uh, so then, you know, when we look across the population of cells, if we look at the cytoplasmic expression level and the nuclear expression level, you know, there's some cells who are going to be in steady state. 
So essentially, you know, there's no rate of change anymore. They're, they're happy. They're just trying to uh, maintain homeostasis. Uh, so, you know, what comes in uh, is equal to what goes out. So that's the steady state. Uh, whereas there's going to be other cells who are uh, actively upregulating the gene. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're increasing transcription, uh, you know, they're actively upregulating this gene, which uh, in theory should lead to a, a observable increase in the, the, the ratio of nuclear expression to cytoplasmic expression. So there is more nuclear expression than what you expect at steady state. Uh, and in contrast, you know, if, it, if a cell is downregulating this gene, uh, they're not actively transcribing as much. Uh, they're just letting the gene degrade. Uh, so therefore, we would expect to see a lower nuclear expression level uh, to cytoplasmic uh, ratio. Uh, and indeed, you know, if we look at some real data, uh, this is what we see. Uh, each point here is a single cell, and uh, these are the expression levels of two genes. Uh, the cells are colored by cell, cell type, roughly. Uh, and you can indeed see, you know, there are some cells that are uh, have higher nuclear expression to cytoplasmic, and others that have lower nuclear to cytoplasmic, and uh, and uh, it's not always the same. You know, the cells uh, in red here have you know higher nuclear to cytoplasmic for this gene and lower uh, nuclear to cytoplasmic for this other gene, and it turns out these genes are genes of the cell cycle, uh, and uh, they they need to be upregulated at different stages as the cell goes through the cell cycle. Uh, so generally speaking, it looks like our model or our data does fit this type of model. Uh, so again, you know, we can then um, use a series of differential equations to uh, to then uh, integrate and predict, you know, at a future time point t, uh, what is the uh, cytoplasmic expression level. Uh, so what this allows us to do is for each cell, not only have uh, its current observed transcriptional state. So this is for one cell, each column is a gene, and there are some genes that are highly expressed now and some genes that are lowly expressed in blue. Um, but what the series of differential equations for every gene that we're able to model will give us is a predicted future expression level for that cell. So perhaps, you know, this, this gene right now is, uh, is in black and it's like, uh, kind of okay, medium expressed, but we can predict that, you know, oh, this, this cell at a future time point is going to, uh, it looks like it's upregulating this gene. So at a future time point, we predict that it's going to have much higher expression of this particular gene uh, and do that for all the genes that we're able to model. Uh, and then this, uh, and then this way, uh, get this, you know, high dimensional vector of the observed state and the predicted future state. Uh, and then we can also then, you know, visualize these uh, predicted, these observed and predicted future transcriptional states by mapping them onto some type of lower dimensional embedding and connecting them with an arrow. So when we apply this to real data, what we end up getting is uh, something like this, uh, where, um, where in this case, this is a single cell data of uh, pancreatic differentiation. Uh, shown on the left here, this is kind of what we expect to see. It's, uh, we, we know uh, that in pancreatic differentiation, we have uh, cycling ductal cells that give rise to endocrine progenitors that eventually differentiate into the different hormone secreting cells in your pancreas. Uh, so then when we apply RNA velocity and you know, we represent each cell here as a dot and they're colored by the same cell types as here, but we can connect you know, the, the observed and the predicted future transcriptional state with an arrow. Um, what you see is indeed, we see um, you know, ductal cells. Uh, the arrows are suggesting that they differentiate into endocrine progenitors and endocrine progenitors differentiate into the hormone secreting cell types, uh, consistent with what we expect based on known biology. Um, but one challenge with this type of visualization approach is that Actually, depending on what type of embedding you use, uh, you can get uh, uh, slightly different you know, interpretations of the underlying biology. Uh, you know, it's, it's fine in this case where we, we know what the uh, uh, relationships between the cells are supposed to be. Uh, we can you know, gauge uh, our embeddings or our, our visualizations and, um, uh, based on this prior knowledge. Um, but of course, you know, from our lab, we're interested in applying this to to uh, fields where we don't necessarily know what is the underlying biology. We're trying to discover that. Uh, so um, so we're, uh, we were concerned that you know, if we were to have applied uh, a different uh, embedding in this particular case, 
uh, shown here. Again, each point is a cell, and you know, we're connecting the observed and future transcriptional states by these arrows. Uh, but what this embedding shows is like, okay, they're cycling ductal cells and they're giving rise to endocrine progenitors. But this embedding suggests to us that the endocrine progenitors are essentially like going over there and they're not at all related to the hormone secreting cell types. Uh, so this type of visualization um, may, you know, if we really you know, relied on it, maybe it would lead us astray. Um, so we were interested in, you know, how can we create a more robust uh, visualization of cellular relationships? And uh, our, our idea is to actually integrate the RNA velocity information itself in visualizing these cellular trajectories. Uh, so this is a method that we developed called VeloViz that was recently published in bioinformatics and led by uh, Lila Ada and my group. So please do check that out if you're interested in learning more. Now, what VeloViz does is, as I mentioned, it integrates RNA velocity information in creating the 2D embedding itself. Uh, so we, we essentially obtain both the observed and predicted future transcriptional states uh, from RNA velocity modeling. Uh, and we, uh, we compute a, um, a graph where we essentially uh, evaluate uh, for every cell, you know, is it, uh, who, it, who does it look more like uh, based on, not only on its, its observed transcriptional state, but also its predicted future transcriptional state. So the idea is that if cell A is moving in, in this high dimensional space uh, towards uh, cell B, you know, at a future time point, we predict that it's going to look more like cell B, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, draw an edge between cell A and cell B. Uh, whereas in contrast, you know, perhaps cell A right now looks like cell C, but it's actually moving in a direction that's uh, different from where cell C is going. So we would not draw uh, uh, an edge between cell A and cell C, um, taking into consideration this future transcriptional state. So, you know, we're able to do this for all cell pairs uh, and there's some, you know, additional pruning that we do, but what we end up with is this higher dimensional graph that relates every cell with, um, with uh, other cells based on their, um, not their observed and predicted future transcriptional states. Uh, and then we can visualize this graph using you know, different types of um, graph embedding approaches. So applying this uh, approach to, again, our pancreatic differentiation data set, uh, what we now with VeloViz are able to get is, um, again, we see the cycling ductal cells uh, that differentiate into the endocrine progenitors. Uh, but now, because we are taking into consideration this predicted future transcriptional state, um, our, our graph structure is able to know that uh, the cells that are uh, at the endocrine progenitor stage their future transcriptional state looks kind of like the hormone secreting cells uh, and are able to essentially uh, ensure that our embedding connects those two populations uh, so that we're able to better uh, make the connection that indeed endocrine progenitors are going to eventually differentiate into cells that uh, give rise to the hormone secreting cells of the pancreas uh, in a way that uh, other embeddings such as uh, UMAP and TISNI and uh, and other approaches that uh, focus more on preserving local cell-cell relationships um, without you know, any knowledge of potential future transcriptional states. Uh, essentially, they're not able to make that connection uh, and, uh, and uh, may give rise to um, uh, uh, visualizations that uh, are not the most consistent with the underlying biology. Yeah, so I hope with that, I've been able to show you how uh, RNA velocity can predict the future transcriptional state of cells, and we can use uh, approaches like VeloViz to take advantage of this type of prediction and actually uh, better and more robustly visualize underlying cellular relationships and dynamic processes. Okay, so uh, just as a you know summary of uh, everything I've shown here today, uh, I hope I've been able to um, uh, um, yeah show you that uh, that. I think uh, new mathematical models and computational approaches are still needed to take advantage of this uh, new exciting uh, um, field of you know, spatially resolved transcriptomics data sets, uh, particularly yeah, in deriving you know, new biological insights. Uh, we developed a, a, a software tool called Meringue that 
uh, provides a statistical framework that builds on Loran's I and geospatial analysis uh, for identifying and characterizing spatial transcriptional heterogeneity. Uh, we also developed the STD Convolve to uh, help recover uh, cell type specific spatial organizational patterns and gene expression variation uh, in these multicellular pixel resolution uh, spatial data sets. And uh, finally, uh, RNA velocity analysis uh, can help uh, predict some of the future, uh, these future transcriptional states of cells from these static snapshots that we're getting. And we can use uh, VeloVis to then take advantage of these uh, predictions to uh, better visualize uh, cellular relationships. Uh, and I think moving forward, it's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, not only in bringing in more mathematical modeling and computational uh, methods development, uh, again, to, to take advantage of this new spatial information to make new biological discoveries. Uh, but then, of course, you know, also applying these tools to um, particularly to disease systems uh, so that you know, we can um, uh, begin you know, better understanding uh, the, the potential uh, um, yeah, biological, uh, the, the spatial organizational differences between uh, health and disease, I think is, is uh, uh, of great interest uh, to my group. So then, yeah, if you're interested in trying out some of our software, um, please feel free to check out our lab website. Uh, we have lots of, uh, all, this, all the tools that I mentioned are available as R packages that you can install. And uh, we have lots of different tutorials for you to play around with uh, some of the uh, built-in data sets you know, before you apply to your own data set and so forth. Um, so please check out our websites uh, for more information. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd just like to thank again all my lab members for contributing to this work, uh, in particular, Brendan Miller uh, uh, and Lila Ada, who led uh, the, pro the, uh, the projects, but everyone really contributed. Uh, and of course, uh, funding sources, uh, NSF, HUDMAP, and uh, the uh, NIGMS uh, and uh, the NIH. And of course, um, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, if you are interested in keeping in touch, you know, you're welcome to you know, reach out to me via email uh, or feel free to visit our lab website and uh, once in a blue moon you can probably find me on twitter um, so thanks again thanks again and um, if there are any questions uh, yeah i'd be happy to press them in. thank you jean lots okay. of virtual <laughs> oh, that was wonderful Hello. Okay. any questions people you can unmute yourself uh, Put in the time in the chat. I think mm. I see a hand from Che. Um, yeah, please unmute yourself. Can't hear uh, you, Che. Bluetooth. <laughs> Still not. Okay, we're typing now. Okay, it's fine. Uh, I'll ask the first one then, and I'll wait for you. So, I was um, Jean, I was thinking about the, the marrying, actually, in this case, that you're finding these clusters of cells which are uh, transcriptionally distinct, but also spatially distinct, right? But actually, the example I saw was in the case of mouse uh, olfactory bulb example in SCD Convolve, you mentioned, <laughs> where you have these spatial clusters, and then you show a UMAP, uh, the, those spatial context is gone, right? And I was thinking how you validate your, I mean, your, the relationship you find in terms of spatial, this W in, in Moron's eye, in, in your case, which is binary, right? So if they are spatially right. neighbor or not, how, how, how you validate that if, for example, if you see those clusters on without the spatial context, you see what I'm trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely an interesting question because you're essentially noticing that um, cell types that are transcriptionally distinct tend to be spatially kind of grouped together, right? Yeah. So yeah. even without the spatial information, we can identify the the yeah, we can identify cell types in the olfactory bulb because they're so transcriptionally distinct, and yet they're also spatially organized in this very layer-like uh, pattern. Yeah. So, what if you if you find this uh, with marrying, you find this this spatially variable genes which are defining clusters, right? So, your mm -hmm. is defining your clusters, and then you basically throw away the spatial information. And how 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 uh, not really throw? 
how you how they look like on a on a on a PCA or in a, in for example. Ah, so essentially, yeah. Given that in the olfactory bulb, um, spatial organization uh, cell types are so spatially organized, you'd essentially be able to. You'd expect to be able to. I guess if you identify all the spatially variable genes, you would essentially recapitulate the cell types. Uh, is that is that an accurate representation of your question? Yeah, because you have the same cell types in two different spatial locations, right? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, you have. I think. All, yeah, all the. Well, yeah, you you do have. Um, yeah, there's this uh, bilateral symmetry, so you would get the same cell types in different spatial. Uh, yeah, mirroring uh, in space. Um, yeah, but I think it it does get to you know what. Uh, what independent information perhaps does spatial variation offer you if uh, the cell types are spatially organized? And I think, yeah, I think for the purposes of method validation, uh, I do agree that you know, if you identify, given that cell types are spatially organized, we'd expect to identify uh, spatially variable genes that are consistent with differentially expressed genes between cell types. Um, however, I think there are, are additional spatially variable genes within cell types and across cell types that are actually very interesting, uh, especially if they're shared across cell types. Uh, so there are you know, different um, yeah, chemokine gradients and other types of gradients that are potentially, um, uh, yeah, they're they're spatially variable, but they're not spatially variable in a way that's unique to one cell type. They're actually across many cell types. And I think, um, yeah, so I think in that sense, you know, moving forward, I do think it's important to use both clustering analysis and spatial analysis to see you know, what is the intersection there and what is independent. And I think that yeah, that could lead to some very interesting insights. And also, I must say that the SCD can well really like because the reference free features, which people should know that you don't need any other assay. You can just use SCD can well on your spatial transcriptomics data without yeah. the reference. Yeah, that's a great observation. Yeah, I think um, yeah, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with all the other deconvolution methods that rely on references. Yeah. Um, and for us, you know, because we are interested in a cancer setting. Uh, it's very difficult for us to obtain two samples and you know do single cell RNA seq and get the reference for you know all of our data sets. Um, so if there's an approach that allows us to uh, to uh, avoid having to get that reference, uh, it just it's. Uh, uh, it, um, it, I'm going to move on to a uh, few people that have asked questions. Jay, I'll go with you first, please. Me you now. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. I think some audio problems have become traditional over the last uh, year or two. Um, th thanks, Jean. Really interesting talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. So there were some very nice microscope slides with the, or like some histology slides with some like fluorescent data on there where things have been tagged. Um, most of this, most of what you showed was tissue scale. Um, what is the minimum resolution on this? Can we look at, say, can we resolve gene expression on a cellular scale or even a subcellular scale? Yeah, really great question. Uh, it depends on the technology that you're looking at. Different technologies offer different resolutions. Uh, in the earlier parts of my talk, uh, these uh, spatially resolved transcriptomic imaging approaches that give molecular resolution, um, things like uh, uh, multiplex air robust fluorescence in situ hybridization or MRFISH, which is what my group, my group or my, my postdoc group uh, developed the technique. And it's the, it's the image you see behind me, that's a Murfish image. Um, but essentially with Murfish, we're able to get uh, molecular resolution. So that means we can actually resolve um, where each you know, RNA molecule is. And we can imagine with that, we can actually look at subcellular organization also. So within, um, uh, within different uh, subcellular organelles, uh, within you know, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, we can look to see what genes are spatially co-localized there. Um, so, 
yeah, so different technologies will give you different resolution. So if you are interested in subcellular, you know, there are, there are technologies available if you're interested in uh, more uh, mesoscale features that don't require a single cell resolution, uh, that there are technologies there too. So thanks very yeah. much. That's great. Um, I was also going to ask if I can, uh, I was very interested in this result you showed about an enhancement of uh, macrophage density in glioblastoma, because um, I know that there is a similar uh, enhancement in uh, macrophage populations in related gliomas. Um, and I want to know uh, roughly what proportion of cells does your result correspond to? Like is it like 10% of all the cells in the tumor or like 50% of all the cells in the tumor or? or... Hmm. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure what percentage of the uh, mesenchymal cells are in the tissue section. Uh, if I were to guesstimate based on the TISME that I showed, um, you know, those were all the cells in the tumor. Uh, they probably close to a third of the cells, I would estimate, are mesenchymal subtypes. Mm -hmm. And you know, each tissue section, we had maybe 6,000 cells, It's my guesstimate. Um, cool, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank so you. yeah, so we're not talking, I guess, about a, like a handful. Like a percentage. Of it. Exactly, it's a, yeah. it's a good chunk. I, I know in some it can get really, really high. Like if you sit down and count on the slide, you can find that maybe every other cell is um, uh, is a macrophage. Like right, right, when you study it, right kind of cross section. But uh, you know that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, um, Norman, could you? Hi, Jean. Um, Thank you ever so much. I, I found, found this a really fascinating talk and uh, one or two people also on this call will know that I actually tried to join this talk exactly a week early. Um, so I've been waiting really excitedly all week um, for, for your talk. Um, I, there are so many questions, particularly from that early part of your talk about um, resolving um, the transcription um, through the RNA um, profiles. Now, I'm wondering whether you've um, could, tried to compare and contrast um, genes involved in uh, the different um, repair pathways. Now, what you don't know is that I, I work in the proton beam therapy center, and we're very interested in being able to resolve the role of homologous recombination against non-homologous end joining, um, and how that varies between um, photon therapy and proton therapy. And I, I wondered whether um, amongst the, the huge number of um, genes that you could um, look at, whether you'd looked at um, comparing and contrasting um, internal repair genes. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. Um, it is not an area that I'm very familiar with. And so therefore, um, yeah, we have not pursue this particular question. However, the data is available uh, and I'd be happy to point you to it if this is something your group is interested in tinkering with. Um, essentially, yeah, we have, you know, all the, uh, so this would be, uh, you know, in U2OS cells, you know, we profile 10,000 different genes and, you know, we have um, the spatial positionings of every RNA molecule inside, you know, thousands of cells. And I think it would be cool to focus on, you know, internal repair genes and see, you know, where are they localized? Um, so I, I think we would be interested in, in pursue, pursuing that. Have any of your samples actually already received any radiotherapy? No, no. We have, um, the only perturbation we've pursued is pyramycin because of our interest in cell cycle. Um, but yeah, we have not really looked at any of the other perturbations. I think perturbations are super cool. Well, there you are. There's a whole new grant application for you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Talk to each other. I think there's something there. So next question is from Saris Manning. Um, Hi. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi, thanks very much for a great talk. I'm particularly interested in the last bit about kind of the dynamics of gene expression, because I come from an imaging background and I'm in, um, able to image a couple of genes at most in live cell microscopy, but obviously single cell um, RNA seq methods are, you know, you get all the genome or, you know, many thousand genes. So I was, I was interested in your visvelo and it looked like um, the kind of region uh, region between your neurogen and three progenitors and the more differentiated genes, there were just no arrows. So there was like no links between the progenitor population and the differentiated cells. I'm just, whereas, you know, in some of the other representations, it looks more like a flow. I'm just wondering if that's just because there are no cells in the transition uh, transition period, or do you think, yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of interested in that. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, uh, for this particular example, we actually did remove the cells that were in that transition phase, okay. um, which is why the UMAP-based embeddings then was unable to uh, make that connection. Right. Yeah. So yeah, great observation. But I guess those are some potentially the genes that you might be in. Sorry, the cells that you might be interested in. They're actually undergoing the transition. So can you can you kind of can your methods deal with them, or did you take them out for uh, for uh, for a specific purpose? Yeah. So we took them out because we were interested in essentially artificially simulating a case where. Uh, we, let's say, may not, uh, there are other contexts where um, we essentially know we're not seeing cells that are immediately undergoing transition. Uh, we know we, um, uh, we're, we're pretty confident that we're seeing kind of the end parts of the differentiation process or the evolutionary process, uh, and we're seeing cells in the earlier transition phases um, but either due to uh, sampling specific limitations or just because uh, the dynamics are very fast uh, through yeah. this particular process, we know we're missing a hunk. And we essentially wanted to make sure the approach is able to still make these connections, even if this uh, middle part of the dynamics is, uh, is uh, the cells representing the middle part of that dynamic process is missing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. 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 Okay. That's, yeah. It's really great. Thanks. Great, oh, great question, thank you. Um, I'm aware that we are running over time. Jean, are you okay to stay if there's any more questions? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to stay on a few more minutes. If people, want to leave, people, want, people want to leave, please feel free to leave. You don't have to wait for stopping the meeting. There is a message uh, in the chat that is, um, I have to go, but would love to know uh, whether you think your approaches are independent enough that you might, for example, be able to specially resolve SCRNA-seq data without prior spatial information with Velovis and interrogate, interrogate the results with Mering? Hmm, um, that's, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, there are other approaches. Yeah, a lot of folks are interested in this type of spatial organizational reconstruction without the spatial information. So essentially taking, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, taking, I guess, single cell RNA sequencing data uh, and trying to reconstruct the prior information or spatial organization. Um, it's hard to say. I think, you know, I guess since my group is interested in understanding how space relates to transcriptional heterogeneity, we're kind of starting from the space part. Um, if we are able to reconstruct the spatial information from the transcriptional information, then that suggests there you know, is an inherent link between the two, but I think it's not necessary per se. Isn't, but, isn't this kind of related to the validation question that you are you want to cluster, relate clusters? Exactly. Clusters, purely transcriptionally defined clusters to the transcriptional and spatial clusters, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think. I think there is a lot of overlap, but I think where a lot of interesting things will come out is actually in the things that don't overlap. <laughs> and because of that, I think, um, yeah, I, I think it's important to, to have access to both uh, so that we can definitively say, you know, this is the, the non-overlapping part. Um, but yeah, definitely an, definitely an interesting question. Thank you. Um, any more questions? 
Um, can I just, if there's none, can I ask just about this um, model selection in SCD control? Uh, finding K is always a problem. I mean, it's not clear in, 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 in um, LDA. So I know you deal with the quite different ways, but I, I find that you have a pixel space, you have a K which is independent of pixel pixels, it's across, it's K same across all pixels, right? Right, it's across all pixels. Um, all, all document, but you, so the pixel, and you assume, you have any assumption on the number of cell types across pixels? Yeah. Um, They're not evenly distributed. I even the number of cells probably, so the cell density. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we do assume that the cell types are not evenly distributed across pixels. Um, yeah. That I think it's a reasonable assumption when we're looking at real tissues that that have spatial organization, but you know, some cell types will be uh, denser and uh, will be higher proportion in some pixels than others. And that's actually what allows us to do um, feature selection, to look for genes that we uh, that are going to be more informative of cell types. Uh, and also, um, yeah, it also helps us within the, uh, with the selection of K. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking if this can help with selecting K in a way, in a way that you, you don't have to run for a longer, like a, you don't have to iterate from K2 to up to K30 something. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question whether there's uh, some theoretical. Um, it's yeah, not really theoretical. Good, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, yeah. 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 Um, uh, even, even if you if you just run, if this is true, then you can just run for a longer, bigger enough, big enough K, and then you can post process. You don't have to do model selection. Just to think uh. might be A1. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, any other any other questions? I think this was a very nice talk and uh, I really enjoy, enjoyed reading the two papers and also your talk. Excellent. I have to read the the, the bioinformatics one still. Fellow is is called. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, yeah, thanks so much for the invitation.